Good evening. Good evening. Good to be with you tonight for our sixth, our final Wednesday service in our Lenten series of God on Trial. Take a couple of seconds, greet each other as brothers and sisters in Jesus. And introduce yourself and get up with somebody. So tonight, uh, the final in our series, God on Trial. Tonight we look at Jesus, God on Trial for the Truth. We'll open with him 543, O oh Jesus, King Most Wonderful.
reading from the Passion or Suffering History of our Savior for tonight is from Mark chapter 15. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. <coughs> they crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We sing in the hour of trial, hymn 406.
grace to you, peace from God our Father, from our Savior who suffered for us but lives for us again. The basis for today's message is from the Gospel of John in chapter 18. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came to the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. So for the previous five weeks of our series, God on Trial, we've seen various things that accompany Jesus, the Son of God, as he stands trial before his human creatures, those whom he has made. And some of the things surrounding it, well, we heard about the accusations that were thrown at him, heard about some of the misconceptions about who he is and what he had said and what he had done, saw how Jesus had to exercise incredible restraint against those who mock him uh, regarding that disciple who handed him over for being arrested. Uh, instead of taking revenge, he has restraint. But tonight, this is what a trial is all about. This is the heart of the matter. Why is God on trial? before people. It's the thing that is at the heart of every trial, in every courtroom. What are we looking for? People who come to testify as witnesses are made to swear. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Trials are about truth. And Jesus, the Son of God, was on trial, is still on trial for the truth. As he stood before Pontius Pilate, we think of him, yes, on trial. He stood on trial before the, uh, the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin. But this was not the first time God had been on trial. The first time <laughs> happened in a garden. There was an accuser. There was a jury, not of his peers, and he was found guilty. God was. The accuser was the one who is given that name. The name Satan in Hebrew means accuser. And there was a jury of a man and a woman. And the accuser kind of asked the same question that Pontius Pilate asked of Jesus. What is truth? God told you this. I'm going to tell you this. And you be the jury. You decide. Did God really say, you will die if you eat fruit from that tree? And when Eve says, yes, that's what he told us. And the accuser says, he's lying to you. You won't die. He's keeping something from you. He knows that when you eat from that tree, you will be like him, knowing good and evil. And he put God on trial. Adam and Eve became the first jury, and they convicted God of telling a lie, and they accepted the accuser as the one telling the truth, which led to their downfall and still is with us today. 
And every human being since, every descendant of Adam and Eve, every day has put and still puts God on trial in our hearts. You see, every time we're faced with, well, is God telling me the truth? With his commandments, with his promises about forgiveness, about life in heaven, or what I think, or we might say what Satan is whispering in our ears. And we've got to make those judgments in a sense we're putting God on trial. <coughs> and when we give in to that which is not what God said, then we've convicted God in the courtroom of our own hearts. But we don't think that he, what he tells us about how we should take care of these bodies or how we should say things with these mouths or so on, then we've convicted him of, of lying to us. We put God on trial for the truth. And one of the ways that that happens also is in what we see the Jewish leaders doing and what, what Pilate did too with putting God, Jesus, on trial. You twist the truth a little bit. They told Pilate, the Jewish leaders, he calls himself Christ, a king. And what they were doing was trying to work things for their own good. Jesus had gained such popularity with the people that they didn't want to listen to the Jewish leaders anymore. They didn't tell them anything that was bringing them peace and comfort and a closer relationship with God. But Jesus told them those things. And that didn't sit well with the Jewish leaders. And so when they finally dragged him to Pilate, calls himself Christ a king. So there's a little truth in there. He did. But then they're using it to tell Pilate that means he's guilty of treason. They've changed their accusation from blasphemy, because that meant nothing to Pontius Pilate, to he's committing treason. He's trying to take your place as ruler in Jerusalem. And Pilate, well, he had his own truth as well. He said, well, it's probably no big loss if I send one more Jew to his execution, Jesus was seen as being kind of, yeah, expendable to Pilate, as long as it saved Pilate's skin and saved his position and his power. And so that was Pilate's truth. And that's the phrase that we hear so often these days. My truth, that's your truth. Asking the same question that Pilate has, what is truth? Well, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, I guess if you wanted to be a little, I don't know, it would be sacrilegious when Pilate asked him, uh, what is truth? Jesus probably could have stood there and looked at it. You're looking at it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth because he has told us who we are and what we really are, and we know it inside. And that's why nobody wants to hear his truth. That's why nobody wants to hear his truth today, you and I included. Because it basically boils down to this. You need me, Jesus said. His people in Nazareth, when he went home to preach, they didn't like it. When he said the words of Isaiah are being fulfilled today in your hearing, that I am here to bring you the good news of forgiveness. You need me. You are a lost and condemned creature. You've put God on trial in your heart every day, and you've convicted him, saying his commandments don't apply to you. But I'm here to tell you that I have come to be perfect for you. I have come to live the truth and be the truth, and to endure the, this, the forsakenness that God brings upon him when he crawls from the cross, as we heard, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? He took that punishment of hell for us. And that's a truth that's freeing, it's liberating. When people live their own truth, that's not liberating. You're just putting yourself into slavery. When you live your own truth, it says some of those commandments of God don't apply to me, such as his commandments about the sixth commandment about marriage and the blessings God puts in there. 
and you take some of those blessings like sex outside of marriage, that doesn't work well. It doesn't lead to any kind of freedom. And I don't think anybody's feeling all that free inside when they live their truth and they're confused. They don't believe what nature is telling them about themselves, the way God created them. And you and I are just as guilty when we think some of those commandments of God don't apply to us that being content, you shall not steal, or you shall not give false testimony on the things that we say about one another. We put God on trial in our hearts there, <laughs> living our own truth. But Jesus came, he speaks the truth to us about our need for forgiveness, to be right with God, to have life with him, and that he's come to do that for us to be the truth, to live the truth, and to take the punishment for us not living by that truth. And that's liberating. He once told a group of people who did believe what he said, if you hold to my teaching, then you are my, really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth for which he is on trial, that he is the savior that everybody needs, the king, who came to be truth for us, that frees us. Frees us from the guilt, the shame, the fear of God's punishment. It frees us to love one another as he has loved us and to see that in what God says, his commands and his promises, there is the liberating truth for us that makes life worth it now and gives us life forever. Amen. The peace of God that goes beyond our understanding Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let's sing, Create in Me a Clean Heart, hymn 942.
And we'll close with hymn 514, You Are the Way. samples. Um, we've been told that the painting in the church should be done right around April 5th, so that's the Friday after Easter, uh, and then a couple of weeks for scaffolding to come down, and then uh, perhaps start looking at uh, dealing with the flooring. So looking for your opinions, uh, there are two pictures, they're very similar. If you want to see them with more distinction, find Jessica Roll and look at her phone. <laughs> Um, so uh, choose one that'll help the committee in picking. They both seem to complement that paint pretty well. So uh, those are, slips are there. <laughs> Other than that, have a blessed evening, and we'll see you Sunday. If you're coming out this way, watch out. There's a cord here that could trigger you.